All right, let's go to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're here. Welcome to this first presentation of our academic year 21 uh, interagency brown bag lecture series. This is a series is a product of a partnership between the Command and General Staff College Foundation and the Command and General Staff School. My name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Command and General Staff College Foundation, and along with my partner, Colonel Scott Green, the director of CGSS, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you here to this series. The intent of the series is to enhance your interagency education while you're here. Um, be aware that this recording, this presentation will be recorded for use for the students that aren't present at the campus, both in the other cohort as well as our satellites, campuses, and our distance learning students, as well as the interagency practitioners around the world. So what that means to you while you're here, if you engage in conversation or have a question with our speaker, please ensure that you uh, uh, turn on the microphones that are at your desk, and all you do is push the little button there and you'll see the red light come on, and that way it'll be picked up on the recording for everyone to be able to hear it, not only here in the room, but it'll also be picked up on the recording. So once again, welcome. We're glad you're here. This series, as I mentioned, is designed to enhance your interagency education. While you're here, we'll have these brown bags once a month. The next presentation is scheduled for 19 November, and it'll be on the domain of space. <laughs> okay, to today's presentation. In the often conf confusing and sometimes shadowy world of the national intelligence community, the Defense Intelligence Agency is probably one of the least understood agencies that operates in that sphere. The DIA operates in support of the warfighter as well as in support of policymakers. It operates both overtly with its core of defense attaches as well as covertly conducting operations in support of U.S. interests around the world. It's the nation's premier all-source military intelligence organization providing authoritative assessments of foreign military intentions and capabilities. We have the pleasure today of having a unique subject matter expert address us on this subject. Mr. Roderick Jackson is the Defense Intelligence Chair here at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, as well as DIA's representative to the Combined Arms Center and Army University. He has over 30 years experience in national security affairs with long-term study and personal interests in security on the continent of Africa. Mr. Jackson has worked for over 17 years at the Defense Intelligence Agency, and he's had a myriad of employment opportunities with them. He's been assigned on several different appointments, and he served as a defense attache in uniform, as well as a policy advisor to AFRICOM, CENTCOM, and UCOM leaders. He holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the United States Military Academy at West Point, and master's degrees in international relations, international business, and strategic intelligence. He's conversant in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Please welcome Mr. Roe Jackson. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here today to start off this series. Um, I'm always excited at the beginning of the year when we see new students and they're ready to learn, eager to learn. So my challenge today is not to talk too fast and to talk clearly. That's always my challenge. Otherwise, we'll do this in 10 minutes and, and it'll be jumbled. Um, so I'd like us to advance the size, please. So today I'm going to talk about my agency. I love my agency. I believe that most people love their, their employment opportunities they have today. But I'm particularly blessed to have, 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 have having had the opportunity to work for DIA for quite a long time in uniform and outside uniform. So to share my experiences with you, uh, I am really, really love to do that. And so before we get started, I just want us to understand that this is not, a, not attributable. So you, you can't really go back to DIA and so say, Roe Jackson said that this is how it works. Um, it's probably not good for us, and, and it's probably not good for anyone, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm going to talk about my lived experiences. I'm going to take all the things, lots of things that we read about, we see, uh, and try and boil them down to some slides that really kind of get out get at how I've experienced agency, how I've lived in this whole national dis security kind of industry, if you will. The other thing is unclassified. So uh, take a look at the slide there. That's what we're going to talk about. We may get to some of it. We may not. It just depends. I would argue that if you have questions, you can ask them. Uh, and I'll, I'll go on a, you know, a, I'll detail off for a minute. 
Uh, but if you can hold them to the end, it's probably better because I'll lose my thought and then I'll have to go come back. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like to start us off with this team aspect. There are 17 agencies in the international community, excuse me, in the intelligence community, and we're part of them. I cannot today imagine taking one away, definitely not taking DIA, because we all add these unique perspectives to the intelligence, problem, intelligence problems that our leaders face. And without this unique perspective, these, dis, these dissenting opinions that at some point become harmonized solutions or harmonized answers, if you will, we put them together. Each agency has its own unique set of tradecraft um, or areas of work, if you, if you will, uh, but there's also a baseline level of tradecraft that uh, each agency has that's kind of common. So that's a good thing. So we all understand how to speak to each other, but we have specific areas of interest, areas of focus that helps us go out and do our job and add these different perspectives into the, the whole mix of the intelligence conundrum, if you will. If you look at this in the 17th, there is something called the Office of the National, uh, the Office of the National Director of Intelligence, yeah, ODNI. Uh, or the direct, and we have a Director of Intelligence. We actually have one that's relatively new, I think, May in May 2020 is um, John Radcliffe. Um, I think he's a former senator, a former politician from Texas. If you, th if you think about ODNI or the National Intelligence Director, as the chairman, you can envision the rest of the agencies are the board members. And the chairman's responsibility is to ensure that the coordinate across the community to ensure that, and I'll use this theme unless I forget or mess it up, to ensure that we're delivering effective, efficient, and legal intelligence products and services to our leaders. And we'll get into a little bit more about why and what that helps them do. But suffice it to say, we're trying to get the best information to our leaders so that they can do something that protects USG interests. That's what we're trying to do. And we do that under the guidance of the ODNI. We do that under the guidance of our directors. And we do that because we love our country and we want to make sure that it's secure. Next slide, please. All right, so we've got a new director. Um, General Ashley just departed uh, 1 October, and General Barrier just took over. Uh, we're all excited about his direction, what he wants to do with, what he wants to do with the agency, the direction he wants to take the agency in. And we've got professionals. So we are transitioned from one leader to another. It'll, it'll, in theory, it'll be transparent, but obviously when there's a new leader, there are things that change. We will adjust and we'll keep going. The, the mission remains the same, is to serve as part of the intelligence community to help work on these challenging problems that our leaders face and help ensure that USG is protected. That's it. So our professionalism will take us through this transition. And we're all excited. Next slide, please. All right, so some of the slides I'll read a little bit more. Some of them I'll let you, I'll let you read and I'll talk some. Uh, this is one I will highlight at several different points. Rod talked about the combat support agency um, and what it, that means. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then I'm going to kind of talk about decision advantage. Um, when I talk about combat support, I use to talk about it from two different levels. To so say, hey, we can go all the way down to the foxhole. I've heard someone say, we can go to the foxhole. In theory, we really don't get to the foxhole, but we can get close, or we actually get there. We can get there because we can put together what is called a national intelligence support team, and it combines the right intelligence, the right intelligence agencies, the right mix of individuals, and they can go and tackle a problem where it is, even if it's at the foxhole. But in theory, we really aren't always down the foxhole. We're normally across uh, the national capital region, COCOMs, uh, and we're in operating environments. And I'll get to that. You'll see some of that. But what we do is we provide this decision advantage. How do we do that? Well, we provide efficient, effective, and, excuse me, and legal intelligence products and services. Well, when we talk about efficient, it means we're not wasting, and we have the right resources to get it done. When we talk about effective, it, 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 it tackles the intended purpose, meaning we don't give them frivolous things. We give them things that are relevant. We give them things that are timely. And then legal, why I mention this legal thing is because there's all types of 
different areas uh, uh, and prohibited zones, for example, you, the reporting on U.S. citizens, that's an area that's very tricky. Um, you know, how you do certain actions, you, some of them require some notification and things like that. So we want to make sure all this is legal. We have lots of people making sure that happens. Okay, so this decision, decision advantage, making sure that our leaders have that information, making sure that they can consider it uh, before they take an action, that is super important. That helps, that helps them make the right decision for a national sense. The other part of what we do is this st uh, st prevent strategic surprise. Um, present, we prevent the, the Pearl Harbor, so we at least attempt to do that. We'll do that by ourselves. Again, if you go back, to, I think, to the second slide, um, you know, we do it with the team. It's part of the team. So this whole team approach is extremely important, breaking these stovepipes and making sure that the community works together as a team to prevent these surprises, um, to collectively give this decision advantage, and, which ensures that our leaders are able to make the right choices, or the right decisions to protect USG. A little bit about the history. Uh, we really got on board in 1962 with the crude Cuban Missile Crisis. People understood that there's a DIA. Uh, if you move forward to the 80s, there was something called the Soviet um, Power um, Report. And uh, it, it, was, it was awesome because we were in the Cold War and it, you know, it went through the, through the 80s. It's been revised. It's, it's a revised product now. It's called the Russian Military Power uh, Document, if you will. And it talks about Russian power as Russia reemerges uh, on the stage to become, you know, one of our peer competitors, if you will, um, to really dis disrupt the um, world system, the international system. Uh, so that's pretty important. And then, you know, in the 90s, we sent a bunch of people out to Iraq and to the, into the theater in general. And um, the strategic reality today is just you, you can't we're, – we're more relevant today than we were back in the 60s. Uh, and again, you know, I cannot see today any of the agencies going away, and especially not DIA, where that's just that important. Our domain, of course, is, as Rod said, it is our adversaries. It is, our domain is understanding everything to be understood, if you will, if that can happen, about mil foreign militaries. We're not worried about necessarily you know, climate change, um, but as a part of the uh, interagency, excuse me, the intelligence community, we work on projects. We, we can contribute to those areas. But that's not our main domain. Our domain is understanding those foreign adversaries. Their intentions, their capabilities, and their courses of action. That's what we try and do. All right, next slide. OK, what keeps DIA busy? Well, you'll see lots of things up there. And most of these you can find if you've looked at the worldwide threat assessment over the last several years. They're familiar themes. These themes have not gone away, and they're likely not going away. Uh, China's always doing something, whether it's launching some. I was reading the other night, and I forgot about SARS in 2003. Um, then I read something about China. They poisoned 300,000 babies with milk in, I think, 2008. And now we have COVID 2019. So there's always something about China. North Korea, what are they doing? Iran, what are we going to do with this nuclear plant? Or, or you know, as we pull out or whatever. So there's always something that's going on. And we have a bunch of intelligent professionals look at these issues. They don't have all the solutions, but they're monitoring them. They're monitoring them. They're producing intelligence. And what are they producing it for? To prevent strategic surprise and to give our leaders decision support. It's a decision advantage. So these are the things that we worry about. And they, they really do keep us busy. I didn't put Africa up. I should put Africa up. The whole of Africa worries, worries me. I'm always reading about Africa and, and how it's going to really affect the U.S. All right. That's, that was uh, sarcastic, but um, it's true at none the least. Next slide. Okay. So say we're big, 16,000-plus employees worldwide. Significant amount of those employees work and live in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's a heavy mix. Uh, no, there's a heavy slant towards civilians. I always thought this was kind of interesting because it's, the, you know, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Well, it's the Defense Intelligence Agency, but we always need new blood. We always need new ideas. 
So I can see how we're led in many cases, a lot of the organizations in the agency are led by military folks, but many of the, the folks who are working in the trenches, they're actually civilians. So uh, it's definitely an interesting mix. I'll talk about culture later if I remember. Um, so we are in all combat commands. We are in certain centers and locations. So for example, we're in Fort Detrick, Maryland in the med looking at medical intelligence. We're down in Alabama looking at space and, and missile intelligence. We're in Ravina Station in Ch Charlottesville uh, looking at ground intelligence. So we're in these places because it's a federated intelligence program, if you will. We're there to the confluences where people are making decisions about different aspects of the, intel of the intelligence problem, if you will, or problems, and we want to there to help shape the solutions, shape the products, uh, and ensure that they have, uh, they are effective, or efficient, effective, and legal. Uh, we want to contribute to that. And then that they end up preventing surprise and provide decision advantage for our leaders. So that, that's where we are. Now, um, we operate on a center's approach. And we weren't always this way, but I think probably around 2010, no, 2000, maybe 2000, somewhere around 2000, when General Flynn came back to the agency, or came to the agency, we really kind of transitioned to this center's approach. And the argument was that we want to put collectors, we want to put operators, we want to put analysts together so they can collaborate more effectively. And again, the end state is to produce better products, better products and services, so da 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 da, as I mentioned. Said. So it works really well because it works well because there are people working the system. But it really works well because you can turn around and say to a collector, I need this. And that collector can go out and get it. Or operator, have you seen this? Can you put special emphasis on this in your collections? Or an analyst, uh, which is getting receiving feedback from collectors. Uh, that you know, we should think and look at these certain areas so you can adjust your course based on this collaboration that we have in the centers, uh, which brings people from all parts of the agency. Okay, four competencies, four core competencies. Uh, I put this slide up here because I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, I put, but I, I note that I put mission support, mission management, excuse me, I may call it, uh, on the bottom. And the reason I put it there is because why it's there, I think, or one reason it's there is because it is the foundation, uh, founding enabler for all the things we do in the agency. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, what do we got? So we got analysis. All right, so I, I normally talk about analysis as a first competency because I honestly, I've been an analyst before, I honestly believe that everything that happens and the agency, the confluence of that is the, the desk of the analyst. Why do I say that? Because you can go out and collect. You can, you can go out and you can set collection parameters. You can go out and operate. You can collect this information. You can, uh, you can, you can assess what's going on. You can, you can do assessments, scientific assessments, or science and technology. You can do all these different things. But the way we communicate with our leaders is through products and services. So the, the, they are, all this information, all this data that's collected, it comes to the desk of an, an analyst. The analyst takes it and he, after his process or processes, processes it, makes the connections, and the final part of this, it, it, the final part of this analysis is a product, a product or service, and that goes into the production part. So a product or service is, 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 is birthed, if you will. And those products and those services, that's how we communicate with our leaders. So I believe it's the, the, the spearhead or the most important part of important competency because it really showcases DIA. It's the, the, the true thing that people can, an analyst came to see me. I read an analyst report. The analyst thinks when you sit down and talk to him. That's how we communicate. That is power. We're speaking truth to power as intelligence is supposed to be, supposed to do it, as, if you will. Or we are actually shaping uh, intelligence, um, or shaping, shape, excuse me, shaping policy, uh, if you will. So it's very important what the analyst does. Um, common one up there is, you know, the military, you know, military capabilities. That's what I kind of did. Um, I think very important uh, warning analysis, uh, preventing that strategic surprise. There's lots of areas to get in to in the analysis field, 
Uh, but uh, it just be, let it be known, and it's, the stomping point is that is, it really is what showcases DIA's greatness because everything comes to the desk, it's analyzed, reports are produced, services are rendered, and people say, are able to say DIA was here. Okay, next slide. Okay, operations. All right, so uh, I'm particularly fond of this area because, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, I served three tours or th in three different countries, really, as defense attaché. I love the overt nature of the defense attaché service. I think it's one of the greater things that we can do. I was charged with making a relationship with a foreign military. I was charged with developing ties, uh, helping to, 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 to build capability, uh, and actually really looking at different things and collecting information. That's what we did. It's overt collection. Um, it is, uh, it really was a, a job that stretched me and allowed me to use everything that I've ever learned, had ever learned in the military, um, to, to work with and make relationships and build relationships and keep relationships with foreign nations, foreign military sp specifically. Um, human, human is, is, is very interesting and, and basically the attache was, is part of that whole human, um, domain, if you will, but it's interesting because it's humans going out to do this. It's not machines, it's not sensor, other sensors, it's just humans. So uh, that becomes much more of the clandestine piece. And if you notice, I put, uh, you know, I put a note about clandestine and covert. And I'll take a moment to kind of talk a little bit about this because I have to go back and sometimes think about it a little bit, although I worked in the domain, uh, the, the, the overt and, the, and, 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 and dealing with clandestine type operations. So the, the, the clandestine operations, that's what we, we do more. That's what we kind of focus on at DIA. And I liken it to an invisible bull in a china shop. So when we think about a bull in a china shop, we think about a bull. A bull's going to go out and tear up things. Well, it's an invisible bull. So if an invisible bull goes in a china shop, and this bull doesn't go around breaking things, although he may be slobbering or tromping around, but he, I don't know how he collects his slobber, but whatever. And uh, he can go and snoop around, look, collect information, and leave out, and no one knows he's been there because he's invisible. Well, in the case of a covert bull, covert invisible bull, the invisible bull goes into the china shop, and he says, I'm a bull, and I tear up things. That bull tears up all kinds of things, and when you leave, the owners look and they say, man, we, we, we need to call the insurance company. We can't, we're going to go out of, out of business or whatever. But the owners don't know what happened. They don't know that the invisible bull came in. So it's not attributable to the bull. It's not attributable to anybody. We don't know. Or they have to analyze and figure out how it's done. All right. So in any case, human, excuse me, the um, operations area is probably what you all are, will come in contact with most. And specifically, uh, unless you're an you're intelligence professional, you'll probably deal with uh, defense attaches or other folks who work in the embassies uh, that are dealing with foreign militaries. And they will be your guides in many cases to help you get through lots of different problems, lots of negotiations to help you affect problem programs um, from the COCOM perspective and sometimes from the components. Uh, so they're very important people in the operation environment. Next slide. Okay, science and technology. Science and technology, I, I kind of talk to people about this, and I tell them, you know, when I went to the National Intelligence University and I was tromping around there about 2010, 2009, I don't even remember, um, they were just launching the whole Masters in Science and Technology. So I really didn't pay too much attention, didn't, didn't understand the importance of it. Well, today, of course, science and technology is something that is just growing by leaps and bounds. You can't escape it. You can't read the paper without someone attacking our our bank accounts or attacking some USG installation or something. So it's, it's here to stay. These young, these individuals are out looking at new technologies, looking at old technologies. They're out assessing attentions, capa intentions, capabilities, and courses of action that our adversaries could affect to damage the USG, plain and simple. Not only are they looking at what the the adversary can do. They're also looking at our systems internally uh, and trying to figure out um, 
you know, how to harden those systems, what are the attacks, where they where are they coming from, and what to do about them. Uh, and that also includes an element of analysis, which, again, we talked about how important analysis is. All this information coming in from these uh, different pursuits within science and technology come back to an analyst, a desk of an analyst, and that analyst is charged with making something out of this information and data that uh, our leaders can use. Next slide, please. Okay, mission support. Ash and trash, if, you, if you're back in the day, if you're a military person, you know the log trains. But I'm telling you, you can't survive without food. You can't survive without fuel. So they're super important. It's kind of the same concept in DIA, I believe, from my, my experiences. You can't survive if you don't have uh, the, the, the communication system, which is so important to the intelligence communities. We provide that for, de de for the Department of Defense. We are the folks who broker that. That that's happens out of uh, mission, ma mission support. Uh, mission management really is mission management. Sorry about that. Um, so that happens out of that that office. Uh, the schools, the, uh, the you know the different uh, areas that you would would not even consider. Those areas are, are housed in, in mission management, and they're very important to the found foundation of how we do work. Because without these good, these services, you can think of the government providing goods and services. Without these goods and services, the analyst couldn't do his job, his her job. And then, oh, by the way, the, we couldn't get the right information to our leaders so they, to prevent strategic surprise, or we would deny them this decision advantage. And that could hinder or hurt USG, the USG. So they're very important. Next slide. OK, so I, and I go through these companies and everything, and so I. People used to ask me, well, what does DI do for the services? And, and, and so I kind of thought about that. I had been living in DI and executing, but I never had really thought about how we go about doing this job of, of being a, an agency that works in the, in an, excuse me, works in the IC, uh, the intelligence community, and also works uh, for, to serve the Department of Defense. And so I kind of broke it down, and so I'll talk through these. You can read them. I believe the most important place that we make a difference in is the National Capital Region. Now, I'm going to tell you, you could argue for the operational environment because those guys out there are doing something. But if we think about strategy starts or is made or decisions are made in D.C., then I believe that's probably the most important place. So we're there. We are shaping policy or influencing policy, speaking truth to power, if you will, um, you know, through our products and our services. And when I talk about engagement, a lot of that is services, excuse me, is, is um, when we go see people and talk to people, we can actually discuss this intelligence. We can make it real because a product is good, you read the product, but if you can have someone come and talk about it and you can go through some discussions back and forth, it really can solidify someone's opinion or someone's thoughts about the situ a situation and what they would like to do or what they think is best to do. Uh, enterprise activities. We do this for every event, all the services uh, the, across DLD. So uh, I'll go through some of them. You got um, ISR, where the functional managers, I believe. Uh, you got foreign disclosure. So who's worked with foreign disclosure? Anybody? anybody? Okay. So so um, so important to um, COCOM operations, or uh, frankly, operations writ large, USG, is our foreign partners. The only way to, to, to give them something from a defense perspective is to have some type of disclosure authorization. We are the ones who control the training and the authorities for foreign disclosure for defense. So it's a huge responsibility. But we really can't function. Well, we're USG, so we can function by ourselves. But our ability to function is enhanced when we use our partnerships. Because, for example, if you're working in Africa, France, in West Africa, France may have much more information than we have, and we have brilliant collectors out doing their jobs, but France has uh, a significant amount of historical experience, ties, and the language that is required in many cases to work in West Africa. So partnering with them makes a lot of sense. Well, we just can't give them information. We've got to have some authority, and that's what we do, is work with these authorities so that we can transfer the information. One of my jobs at Africom was to make these relationships 
with all these different foreign entities, and that required uh, sometimes, you know, getting these different releases um, to make sure we could actually share information with them. So it's very important what we do. So uh, intelligence training, um, we do that at our organization. We do mobile training teams that goes out to different installations, and we train people. Um, we teach people. We promulgate our intelligence tradecraft down in the COCOMs because our guys work down those COCOMs. Uh, we are instrumental in figuring out managing the ISR, the, the defense ISR program. So we get, get, get to make decisions on allocations and, and uh, funding for those programs. So that's pretty, pretty neat. Um, anybody for me with J, the, 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 the J2, uh, the joint staff? Anybody have any familiarity with that? In any case, well, the, J, the joint staff it runs a watch. This watch is pretty important. So J2, I mean, DIA actually are the, is, are the folks who, who staff this watch. So every morning we get up and we brief the G2, J2 and we tell them this is what you should look out for, this is what's happening, da, da, da. Super, super important. We're the analytic authority, defense analytic authority. I think this is super important because what this means is if we're working on a international community-wide product, and I'll talk about one a little later uh, if we, as we go through the slides, there are different inputs from these 17, diff 17 agencies. Well, some of those agencies are DOD agencies. So the DOD agencies just can't go back to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and say, here's my input. They actually have to come through DIA. DIA adjudicates all of the defense input as one single authority and says, here, Director of National Intelligence, this is the Department of Defense's input to this problem. So we're responsible for the good, bad, ugly uh, of, of what our agencies do. But there's a lot of reconciling process, there's a lot of revisions, there's a lot of, you know, the, you know thinks this is a good product and this is additions. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brokered type relationship, but we are at the pointy end of the spear uh, to communicate with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. That doesn't mean that the other services don't participate in some of these forums. The, but it just means that we are the ones responsible for making sure that, yes, we put one stamp of approval on that from the Department of Defense, and it's all good. All right, so um, COCOMs. The COCOM, I love working in COCOMs. I worked in several of them, to tell you the truth, as a J5er and also as a J2er. I believe that the COCOM represents the confluence of where the services and DIA meet. Because the COCOMs are run by DIA individuals. That may be a stretch. The COCOMs are staffed by DIA individuals. Normally, you'll have a J-2 military person, and you may have a deputy that's uh, a DIA civilian, um, or you may have an uh, assistant J-2 that's a DIA civilian. They're definitely highly placed. The analytical arm is, is run normally by uh, J-2 civilian, and normally it's an SES, SES, SES level um, person. Um, but in the COCOMs, since we run, we run the COCOMs, we staff the COCOMs, we pr promulgate our intelligence tradecraft, um, we are responsible for um, coordinating intelligence support, intelligence plans, intelligence operations, all the way down to the JTFs all the way down into the operational environment, whoever's up, whoever's up in there. That requires this whole reach back thing, if you will, back to, D, back to DIA Central in Washington, D.C. to ensure that everything's th streamlined down to the FOXO or down to definitely a JTF. We're responsible for the, the dynamic threat assessment or threat assessment, if you will, estimates, these things. Uh, and that all happens in coordination with with DIA Central, COCOMs, where all these different DIA individuals are working uh, and putting together products and services and working with the services, and it's pushed down to the uh, folks who are operating in the, in the environment. The J2 is a place that uh, looks at intentions, again, intentions, capabilities, and courses of action, and they look at what's happening in the operating environment, if there are shortages, the J2, 
RIT DIA is responsible for pushing that back to, 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 to DC and the executive agent really is um, DIA and they coordinate these for these shortages, fill these gaps. They help coordinate these and fill these gaps. Uh, so the very, very important aspect of the COCOM and what they do. Now, in the operating environment, I think the most visible uh, people you'll see in DIA or visible footprint of DIA is, is at the defense attache at that office. Um, those defense, those descent, defense attaches, they work for DIA. They're military, but they're, they're, they're fed and, and, and trained uh, and guided by DIA. Uh, and there are also other civilians working in those offices. Uh, down in the operating environment, DIA has folks out doing, I mean, conducting act, uh, intelligence activities. And as I mentioned before, uh, DIA can actually get way, way down to the foxhole uh, in these national intelligence support teams. Also, DIA is integral in JTS. For example, there's a JTF in, the, on, in Horn, Africa, and uh, it's called Clamp Limoye. And DIA members provide uh, the, the, uh, the continuity for this organization because it really is a rotational six month job for reservists who come in. So we are down there periodically. Um, spending six, seven months, and maybe even a year to make sure that that continuity exists and folks can execute their missions. All right, next slide. Okay, so um, you got to look at how DIA kind of in you know, intermix in the, you know, the different uh, levels there. And so what I like to talk about when I do this type of brief is, well, what does that mean? How do we really get this product out that I keep in service out that I keep talking about is so important. But when I got here and they told me I was going to work on thesis, the thesis projects, I kind of said, well, it's kind of like a thesis. So I took the, the intelligence process and took a look at it. And you can see is you kind of, we got to go around clockwise and we have to get plan of direction. Well, that plan of direction, you can see some of the people who contributed to that. But that gives us this idea, gives us this guidance on where we go, what we go collect for. And then we go to the collection piece, and you see the folks who participate in that. DIA writ large, in the, for example, in the capital region, have, we're collecting. We have collection managers. We have collections and collection managers at COCOMs. Uh, you have other services, other, other, um, other members of the IC writ large. You have Policymakers, so anybody who can put in a report can be part of this whole collection piece. Or anybody can submit information to someone who can put in a report can be part of the collection piece. Uh, we're not necessarily just, I don't want to say you, you take anything, but information is just that until it's turned into intelligence. So you want to be careful when you discount information because you may discount a piece of the puzzle that's super important. But all information has to be processed. So, you, you know, you, you may get um, a list of phone numbers. Well, you got to process that list. You got to turn that list into, into something that is a set of numbers that are linked to uh, a set of people. So you have to process this information, process this data. Uh, and then once you process this data, then you can move to the analysis phase and you can start to make connections. Well, what does this mean? Johnny is talking to Susie at number 505. Well, Johnny talked to Susie last night, he talked to her this night, he talked to this other guy. What does that mean? Uh, and that's part of the analysis piece. And once that analysis is done, those conclusions uh, are determined and they are matched with intentions, capabilities, and courses of action, the analyst, the final part of this is the analyst produces a report or he produces a service, if you will. I mean, a, a, a service, I think. Uh, and that report or that product is disseminated. It's disseminated across uh, different lines of communication that reach our policymakers, uh, or it's briefed to different policymakers so that they can gain, uh, gain insight into the problems that the USG are facing. And of course, there's a feedback loop, which is very difficult because all of us are busy. Leaders are busy. They take information. They consume information, but they don't necessarily always have the time to tell you that this is good. But the feedback is important, nonetheless, 
because that goes back into supporting how we come up with our planning direction and then where we go to collect. So it's super important to try and get that feedback. So it all works together so that we produce the products and services that actually go forward to our leaders that prevent, help prevent uh, strategic surprise, that gives them decision advantage, and then they're able to make decisions that best support protecting the USG. So that's DIA's kind of process, or, or maybe even a similar process in other agencies. Next slide, please. All right, so the question is, we, the point is we said that we had this um, Office of National Director of Intelligence, and we have, you know, he's the chairman of the board. So all the other agencies have their similar processes for, for treating information and converting that into intelligence. So we come together when there's a need, and in many cases, one of the prime times we come together is when we produce what is called a national intelligence estimate. And I think I put a little down at the bottom there so you can read a little bit about it. So the national intelligence estimate is a product that looks at a particular problem and it discusses that problem. And it kind of really looks at, again, if you keep the theme, intentions, capabilities, and courses of action, it kind of gives an assessment and an estimate, if you will, assessment slash estimate of where this problem is going, how this problem could affect the USG, and perhaps what we should do about it. And to get to this end state product, if you put us in a square box, then you have the DIA process, and you have all the other 15 agencies executing their processes, and then you have ODNI, who is kind of honcho in this process. I was thinking about this and said, well, you know when you were back in the, well, when you go to the battalion or you're back in the battalion, if you were already there, you did the planning process and you went out and you did your little planning staff. And at the same time, the commander was doing his planning. He was thinking about this problem too. And so, uh, and his, he was working his processes. So the individual agencies are working their processes and ODI, ODI is working this process, which includes um, collaborating with leaders, collaborating with different uh, uh, agencies in the IC, and preparing to like mesh all this information together. So as the gears are turning, and they turn, it leads to this product, the output, that provides this information to our customers. And it's very simple. We go back to the theme I've been preaching the whole time, is our senior leaders. It's a product that's meant, uh, that, that goes to those senior leaders, and it helps prevent this surprise. Uh, it helps give them decision advantage, which helps take care of USG. So we go back from the top. We started with DIA is this organization, has these companies, has 16,000 plus or minus people all over the world. And we move through this whole process. Of, well, they, they, they go out and they do things. They actually do things. And in the produce intelligence, they have an individual process. It's kind of unique, but you know, it's, there's some similarities across the board. And it's all honcho by the chairman of the board, ODNI. And that all, and it's our, it's, it's his mission is to make sure those products come out and those services go out. But in, in the, the overarching theme, I'd say, is efficient, effective, and legal. And that's where we get to the NIE. That's the end state of all of this. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of different products, but this is one of the, this is a, a Cadillac product, if you will. All right, next slide. Okay, so that kind of brings me to the end. I got, I got, uh, I got a little bit more. Uh, before I go into the, I got five things I'll post to you, and I'll talk about real quick, and they'll, they'll be quick. Uh, I do electives. I teach electives. I chair thesis products, projects, if you will. Uh, and I'm not opposed to teaching individual electives. Uh, so if you have questions or thoughts or, or interest, uh, especially in Africa, uh, please um, don't hesitate to talk, to talk to me. Okay, so I'm going to leave you, I'm going to try and leave you with several thoughts before you ask questions. So the first one is why DIA matters. I think I've been preaching the whole time. I think DIA matters because it is the premier organization that looks at uh, adversaries. That's the domain, is dominating the, the understanding on 
What are their intentions, their capabilities, and the courses of action? What do we do for the services? Well, I talked about that at the National Capital Region and also in the COCOMs. I think what we do, one of the overarching things we do is, is this fraternal order in the, within the in, intelligence domain that we work together, that we're struggling together, that we're succeeding together, and that's all to go back to this whole thing of helping prevent strategic surprise, give our leaders decision, science, decision advantage, and get this, the right information, which is effective, efficient, and legal to our leadership. So I, I think that's how we work with, more is, maybe it's more how we work with and what we do for the service. But that whole enterprise function is very important. Because without it, who would do it? It would be 15 different, it's not 15, so it would be several different services running around trying to, to figure out what is, the, what is the best way to, to allocate ISR. So we're the ones who do that. And that supports all our services. We go down to the foxhole if we have to with the NIST teams to support our services. We work in JFTs, uh, all types of things uh, associated with the operational environment. We're there and we're supporting services. Okay, how do you access DIA? Well, the simple thing is probably come and see me uh, and I can ask a question to our higher ups. Uh, they're all busy, so you have to be patient and sometimes it takes a lot of time, but uh, we, we try and some of the questions I ask myself. I think more importantly, though, is for you as uh, professionals going back out into the field is if you're not an intelligence professional, probably if you're an intelligence professional, you may have a better grasp of how this works because you would have access to communication tools that would allow you to, to work with DIA. DIA. But if you're not, the question is what should I know about DIA and how should I think about DIA, I believe. And I think the way you should consider thinking about DIA is DIA is there. Um, did your S2 or G2 think about that? Did they coordinate their products or their research uh, with DIA? Did they use the products? And, and your job is to force this um, utilage, if you will, um, the, force DIA to work with collections and things like that if there's need. But to check, to make sure that they're doing their job. Um, and if you need to go to DIA and you have S2 or G2, then they'll know how to get in touch with DIA. In many cases, it's almost as if you may want to talk to DIA about a particular intelligence problem um, that you're facing. And in most respects, at the battalion low level, um, that would really eventually get linked back through a COCOM. So your S2 would be intimately involved with helping you do that. All right, now if you had access to different communication means, then you could probably go in and play around with yourself. The only problem is when someone who is unknown is sending a message to somebody in DIA to ask about some product, everybody's leery about that. So it becomes a little bit more um, troubling. All right, so what is DIA's culture like? Well, I'm telling you, it's fluid. It's great. It's, it's, it's great because you have, you know, X generation, Y generation, Pepsi generation, all these people. Uh, I've been to a couple of classes where they talk about the, the divides and how to get through that. But it's great because you got young people, you got old people, you got experienced people, you got new people. It is a place that is filled with adventure. And if you like to stare at a computer screen like I do in a very non-animated uh, uh, way, then it's a great place to be if you'd like to be an analyst. But there are other things to do. And if you have a profession, there's actually a space for you at DIA. Perhaps, maybe not, I can't give you a job tomorrow, but there's a function at DIA that you could probably feel if there were an opportunity. Okay, my last point. Why do I work for DIA? I work for DIA because it's home. And I kind of thought about this. I said, you know, people down in, down in the Gulf, they're always getting flooded out, and they go back to the, their houses, they rebuild. And you say, well, why do these people keep doing this? It just keeps flooding. Well, it's home. It's, where the, it's what they know. It's what they've done. It's, it's where they have their dreams and, and, their, and you know, their, their nightmares also. But it's home. DIA is home for me. DIA has allowed me to grow. It has allowed me to stretch. It has allowed me to experience all types of um, professional opportunities uh, and, 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 and feel like I'm part of something bigger than myself. And I think that bigger than myself thing is that I know when I go home and I pull out my other books to read that I am 
essential to help and ensure that the USG is safe. And so I work for DIA because I believe in our country. I believe in what the agency does. And uh, I like being a part of it. And it's home. All right, I think that's enough for me talking. If you have any questions, I'll take them. And thank you very much. And hopefully I didn't talk too fast uh, and talk uh, jarbled. Please remember to uh, activate your microphone when you ask your question. I'll ask a question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Major Robin Cox from Staff Group 8 Delta. Um, so the DIA as an all-source agency it duplicates some collection efforts that in domains that are more traditionally, I guess, owned by other intelligence agencies. Um, for instance, clandestine human intelligence is also kind of done more by the CIA. So my question is, sir, what is the benefit then of the DIA doing some of those collection efforts in-house um, as opposed to simply being an all-source fusion analysis cell for the intelligence agencies? Okay, so let's try and pick that apart, I think. First of all, we are an all-source intelligence agency. So I, I don't know, I'm not trying to say you didn't say that, but, but we are an all-source intelligence agency. So, and, and open source is huge. I mean, it's open source, social media. Um, you have to be careful about it, but, but that's, that's definitely um, a domain that's not going away. Um, in terms of, you know, clandestine versus covert and, and collections and all these things, I think I kind of mentioned is that we, we're 17 theory, 17, in theory, 17 different agencies. Each agency brings its own special flavor, if you will, to the intelligence conundrum, okay? So everyone has a voice. And so if you have one person talking, then you could harmonize what the downspout is, but if you have one person talking, then you don't have the scent, you don't have analysis, you don't have discussion, you don't have um, refinement, so it just it just it'd be like you program the robot and you got the answer. So what the 17 agencies do for the USG is they bring in this heterogeneous. I'm going to use a big word. I hope I got it right. Since you're real cacophony, and um, of, of 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 intelligence, different intelligence stuff, if you will. And so it comes in and it gives people more. A, the ability, a greater ability to think about the problem and to see the nuances because the CIA may see something, say, see something from one perspective. NGA is a whole different domain, a whole different domain. But you need that perspective because, honestly, you can't do too much without NGA, really, especially if you're on the water, that's for sure. Um, so you, you need all these different perspectives because they have different uh, areas of expertise, and I think I mentioned it when I, earlier, is I can't see us doing away with an agency today because they're so specialized. They have a common, there's a, there's a mandated common baseline um, um, tradecraft, but it looks, still looks different from each agency. It's not like one person says, this is everything everybody's going to want. This is what you have to, this is what you have to teach, and then agencies do it differently. So we, we're so specialized, some of it is kind of vanilla, but very little part of it. Some of it is who we actually work for, colors, how we do business. For example, we, are, we work for the Secretary of Defense. CIA works for the President. The perspective of your customer changes how you work. It changes analysis. We could talk about the same problem, but it, the perspective be, could be totally different because NGA is thinking about, you know, how this affects communications. Uh, I, we're thinking about the, the, the people on the ground. CIA is thinking about, who knows what CIA is thinking, but, but they're thinking about, for example, you know, sabotage and, 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 and how, you know, how to actually go out and conduct this invisible bull in the China shop activity. Um, so, and it all comes together about how to approach this issue and, 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 and just because we say intentions and capabilities and course of actions, they're represented by X, the other agencies get to say how they feel about these intentions, capabilities, and courses of action. And so then that all has to be adjudicated. And if we don't go to groupthink, we actually get a better product. If we go to groupthink, then it may not be the greatest product. Well, as professionals, 
we are really constantly working with these biases and trying to get away from groupthink and things like that. So we don't want to suffice. That sometimes invites, I would say, conflict or difference of opinion. But that's good because that makes the product that much stronger. Now, I'm not sure if I answered that, but. Um, you did, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next question. I can hear you. DIA or other agencies, have you felt like you've had to make adjustments in how you present materials, how you analyze materials, given that whatever product you produce is going to see, be seen through partisanship? So, um, so we're military people here. Most of us have served for quite a while or retired or whatever. So when we go to the battlefield, unless we are an insider threat, we go. Our boss says, after we've had the discussions, boss says we've taken this course of action, we go. It's just gone. We don't really think about, you know, how the enemy is going to think of us when we whack them. We just go. And that's a professional pursuit that we're going. We are done with discussing with our boss the merits of his decision, but we just go. So what I would argue is that we are professionals. 17 agencies dedicated to being professional. Now, let me be clear. I mean, obviously, it's hard to separate the p politics from professionalism deep down inside and our, some of our beliefs. But the thought is that we spend so much time drilling and becoming professionals, and we are proud of our work, uh, and we learn about biases, biases, and some of these biases, some of these things, if you're too biased, if, in theory, if you, you, you're giving the president your thoughts or you're giving senior leaders your thoughts that they're going to use to make decisions which could get a lot of people killed. I remember when I was at CENTCOM and I realized I was on the, I realized that I was working an issue and if I did not resolve this issue, it would mean that a certain group of soldiers would not get to the battlefield in a timely manner to relieve or support others, and that could get some people killed. So I think when we bring professionalism, when you consider professionalism, I think without a doubt most of the intelligence professionals I've known are wholly in it to use the facts, the facts, Jack, and nothing but the facts, and move forward. Now, that doesn't mean that you know politics aren't part of play and politics get involved, but our job is to give, take the facts, assess the facts, make assessments, and estimates. And that's it. And I think for the most part, that's what we do. So just one data point. I think uh, several years ago, maybe 2000, when was it? 2014, 15, somewhere around there. Somebody correct? There was a big ho hoopla about um, politicization at CENTCOM, and they all went through and determined that it really there was no politicization. The issue was that I think senior leaders were not so uh, upped on some of the newer techniques, and there was a disconnect on what people thought. So I think most recently we haven't seen that. But obviously, you know, the deeper you get in the, in the politics uh, in different administrations, you may have, you know, it, it just depends. But from a professional standpoint, all of the professionals I've ever worked with, it's all about facts, Jack, and taking those facts, making those assessments. Uh, and estimates and moving forward. Supporting USG. All right. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We appreciate your presentation on DI today. 
Um, he will remain up here if you have questions you want to talk to him post the briefing. I want to remind you that we'll have our next presentation of the brown bag will be on 19 November right here, 1230 in this room. It'll be about the domain of space. You're all invited. I invite you to uh, let your classmates and faculty know they're all welcome. Um, and just be aware that this presentation will be posted on the college's blackboard as well as it'll be at the foundation's website and on our YouTube channel if you wish to view it or share it with other folks um, that you know about. So once again, thank you all for attending. Hope to see you next month. Stay safe.